So welcome to Conversations with Melissa. Today, my guest is Cynthia Hammer, founder of the Inattentive ADHD Coalition. And this is brought to my sponsor. My host is Renify. So I want to thank Renify first. At Renify, we teach about the underlying drivers of our behavior, and that knowledge leads to better decisions and better decisions lead to an improved quality of life, visit renify.com, R-E-N-A, F is in Frank, I. Okay. Again, thank you to Renify. So let me introduce my guest. You are another person diagnosed uh, like myself in your 40s, um, but you took that being diagnosed and you dug in deep. Hey, you learned a lot about uh, ADHD. You made that ADD resources that you did for 15 years. And now in this time, in the, in the 2020s, you're making another nonprofit, the uh, Inattentive ADHD Coalition. Um, I just love how, how much this uh, you bring to it for your own quest, your own search, and then how you share it not just with your family, but with other people like myself, other people with ADHD that you, you bring it to that, to that level out, out to other people. Um, thank you so much for being my guest. Here. Oh, thank, thank you, Melissa. But let's start with inattentive ADD. Since that is your current mission, can you say what distinguishes inattentive type? Or should we start with your life story? Where, do, where would you like to start? Um, well, I guess start with what my major concern is, is because although the DSM talks about inattentive as a separate type, often when people start talking about ADHD, they talk about it like it's one monolithic condition. And I feel like when they do that, they start talking about people being high energy, people, um, talking a lot, talking quickly. And those things don't really apply to most people that have the inattentive type of ADHD. So I think that while we're recognized in another way, we get overlooked because the way people talk about it, they might just be looking for people that are high energy. They might just be looking for people who are talking a lot, who are, who are restless and have trouble sitting still. And that doesn't describe those of us usually that have the inattentive type. So that was what my motivation was for finding the nonprofit was after, well, I wrote a book and then I learned about, I always knew I had inattentive type, but I didn't realize in all those years that I had left the ADD resources, that I became a, re a retired person. I didn't realize that inattentive ADHD continued to be overlooked in children. And what woke me up to that is a woman writing a blog post on Attitude Magazine, a guest blog post. She just said she was so angry because even though people recognized there was something troubling her because she was an excellent student sometimes and not a good student other times. She went for professional evaluation. And although she was only 23 years old, no one picked up on the fact that she had inattentive ADHD. There just was not enough knowledge out there to help her get recognized. So here she was at 23 years old, writing a guest blog on attitude about how angry she was. She was told, you know, just move on with your life. Now you got your diagnosis, you can work on strategies to make your life better. She said she was having a problem moving on because she was just so angry. And so when I heard that, that's what inspired me to start the new nonprofit for the inattentive types because we're not being recognized enough. Now, I'm not, I'm talking a lot because I'm kind of charged up about this topic, but recently I had the idea of, well, I want to find out how the, um, the combined type of woman differs from the inattentive type of woman because often they talk about girls with ADHD as though they're one monolith too. And I wanted to find out if the women with the combined type 
differ very much from the women with the annotative type. I've only interviewed like eight women so far. And if anyone listening is combined type, I'd be happy to interview you to make you part of this group of 25. But what I'm finding out, which is surprising me, is that they didn't get diagnosed either. So the combined type, as long as you're a female, you usually have your, your hyperactivity is expressed through uh, being very verbal and very talkative, but you're not physically active. And it seems what I, maybe I'm um, going beyond what I, where the knowledge is, but it seems that the ones that are getting diagnosed are ones who are physically hyperactive. You know, the ones that are getting up out of their seat in the classroom and the others, if they don't show that symptom of physical hyperactivity, but they're showing it in how talkative they are and how many ideas they have, then they're still getting missed. So I'm just saying my concern started out being within attentive, but now my concern is broadening to be all the children, no matter what type of ADHD they have, that are still being overlooked. And meanwhile, we've learned how important early diagnosis is. I, do you want to ask me a question, Melissa, or you just want me to go on and keep talking? I have to say, I have learned to let people finish their sentences. Uh, well, if this isn't a sentence, this is more like a, a short lecture, but... Um, you, now I lost you're my You're eating thought. it up. You have said a tremendous amount. You started out with the DSM. So I just want to go back one little step and say, what is the DSM and why is that uh, significant to this conversation? Oh, I don't even remember when the DSM-5 came out. It might have been even eight years or more ago. But the definition and what a lot of prescribers, clinicians would go off of and what the rating scales are based on are the criteria in the DSM-5. And the DSM-5 breaks it into inattentive and then also separately hyperactive impulsive. And I think there are about eight symptoms for each type. And if you're mm. inattentive, I can read you those types if you want me to. Do you want me to go over the symptoms? Let's come right back to that. I'm, I feel like we're, we do want to know those. I, I know we want to know those. Um, we've been talking about kids having trouble be getting diagnosed. And I know when I talk with other women that either combined type or inattentive is more often what they'll identify with mm -hmm. and that we, we weren't diagnosed as children. We have difficulty getting diagnosed as adults. So um, I know you're gonna talk about these criteria where we have some adults in the room. I'm sure there's parents who are interested in the, what are the symptoms in kids, but we, we need to be even handed with, with that. Some things have to do with, uh, so, some people are in here listening for themselves as adults. Okay. Right. but. You made me want to finish my thought about why it's so important for children to get diagnosed early. Um, we're finding out from Dr. Ruck Russell Barkley's research that people with unidentified, undiagnosed, untreated ADHD are dying on average 12 years earlier than the average population. And some of the explanations for those earlier deaths are accidents, car accidents, sometimes it's suicide, sometimes they develop health problems, which overeating or diabetes, there's a lot of health problems that they might develop. And even though they go to see the doctor, they aren't able to follow the doctor's regime. You know, because of their untreated ADHD, they're often unable to actually practice good health practices. So that early diagnosis is going to help your child grow up in a healthier way with a healthier self-esteem and self-confidence for interviewing adults with inattentive ADHD. And they're telling us how different their lives would have been if they were diagnosed as children. They wouldn't have developed anxiety. They wouldn't have developed depression or low self-esteem or self-confidence. They said that um, having ADHD is not the problem. Most of us eventually feel like 
we have we cre can can create good lives for ourselves but not knowing we have adhd is the problem because we don't understand ourselves we don't know what is going to make us function our best and we're often in situations where where we don't function our best and that creates our low self-esteem and poor self-confidence.